Bend Around the Wind by Skylia Chapter 81 Earth Day 3 Another night spent without sleep, but to be honest, Tony was way beyond feeling tired. He was too worried, wound too tight to be able to sleep. Pepper was making noise about him needing to rest, and even Rody and Bruce helped her, but Tony couldn't. He cared more about coaxing Juyu to sleep. That was something to focus on, making sure she was as fine as possible. But even when she was out, Tony didn't try to get rest. Instead, he sat beside the bed B was lying on and watched how Hatchet gradually lost all color from his face, how the circles under his eyes got darker, how his lips paled and his eyes dimmed as the hours ticked by. His own helplessness was driving him crazy. The nosebleeds happened with more and more frequency, and after a while, even Hatchet gave up on trying to pretend that he was fine. He settled on saying that he'll live. It didn't reassure Tony for obvious reasons, not one bit. When he noticed the first tremors in Hatchet's hand and shoulders, the light shaking and the sweat dripping down his temples like he had a fever, Tony was tempted to try and put an end to it, but Hatchet said no before he could get even a word out. Hatchet, I know how bad this can get, Tony said. I saw it happen with Loki. Would you rather I stopped and left her to her fate? Hatchet asked in return. Tony looked down at B's pale and motionless face, and his heart ached like it was crushed inside his too tight chest. What was he supposed to say to that? Make sure Hatchet did everything that was possible to keep her alive? Or was he supposed to remind the elf that two deaths were worse than one? I'm not going to die, Hadjit said. His tone was more reassuring now than before, but he looked worse and worse. So Tony was not sure if he believed him. But ultimately, it was Hadjit's decision. All the while, Tony stood by, unable to do anything for the people he should be able to protect. It made him angry beyond words. Somewhere around dawn, Pepper came up with the idea of protein shakes. It was not like Hatchet could sit down and eat a five-course meal to keep up his strength, so Pepper got him these extremely nutritious smoothie things. Tony should have thought about that sooner, but he was too out of his mind with worry and anger to think clearly. Like so many times over the years, he blessed his lucky stars that he had her around. When Hatchet took the first gulp from the tall glass Pepper shoved in his face, he made a curious sound. What did I just put in my mouth again? He asked. Vanilla almond milk, bananas, blueberries, sugar, and lots and lots of protein. She said, drink it all. You're getting a second one. Hadja just looked at her for a moment, then huffed and gave a tired smile. Yes, ma'am. He said and down the whole glass. Thanks, Bob. Tony said when she was walking out of the room. Sleep, Tony, or I swear I will knock you out. She said sternly. Tony could hear the worry in her tone and saw the concern written plainly on her face, so he nodded. I'll try, he said. It was not what Pepper wanted to hear, but it was all Tony could promise at the moment. When Tony woke from his restless slumber, Ju Yu was up holding onto B's hand, so he didn't feel that bad about leaving the room for a little while. Hatchet didn't look any better, but at least he didn't look that much worse, either. There was fresh blood on his shirt sleeve, though, so that told Tony enough about how bad it still was. He managed to eat a piece of toast before his stomach turned and he gave up on it. He gulped down a glass of juice, then went to wash his face with cold water. None of it really made him feel any better. He stared at his tired face in the mirror, the dark rings under his eyes, and his pale skin. And all he could think about was that how much healthier he looked than Hatchet right now. He let his forehead rest on the cool surface of the mirror and tried to breathe evenly. He wanted Loki back. Badly. He was supposed to be able to handle things on his own. He did for years. But now Loki was gone for a couple of days and Tony's pathetically useless. He couldn't protect his own house and the people within. He failed. He failed so badly. His injured shoulder ached from the way he was leaning on the sink, but he welcomed the pain. It cleared his head, even if just a little. Tony? Someone called, and it took him a moment to recognize Rody's voice. Yeah? He asked, pulling himself away from the mirror and washing his hands again just to do something. He didn't look up at his friend. I know that look on your face. You're beating yourself up about this. Rody said, they caught you by surprise. There's nothing you could have, but that's exactly it. 
Tony yelled and turned around to face him. They always catch me by surprise. They attacked this house before and Pepper got hurt. I got myself kidnapped two separate times like an idiot. And now they just marched in here again, shooting at us. A surprise attack is not an excuse. I should know better by now. I should not lower my guard down this much. Tony, that's bull, Rody said, still calm. You can't be alert constantly. That's how we lived on the ship. Tony said, leaning back on the sink with a deep sigh. I never made mistakes like this out in space. I knew danger was lurking everywhere. I knew things could go to hell easily, and they did. Things constantly went to hell, but we handled it. Now Loki leaves me alone for a bit, and I screw up. I screwed up so much. Brody sighed, keeping silent for a moment. Look, I'm not even going to try to claim that I know the guy, okay? He said finally, but if he really feels about you the way you've been trying to convince me he does, then he won't think you screwed up. Nobody thinks that you screwed up, Tony. Tony bit his lips and wrapped his arms around his torso, holding himself. I do, he said, looking up at Rody again. Then you're wrong, Rody said evenly, not breaking eye contact. Tony didn't argue, but didn't agree with him either. If he said anything else, then Rody would just try to convince him more that he was wrong. He didn't want to be convinced, and he didn't want to feel better about the situation. And FYI, you can't keep ignoring Steve forever, Rody said. He's been calling me now, too. You should talk to him. I'm not really interested, Tony started, but Rody interrupted. I know he's not your friend, Rody said, but he would be if you'd let him. Tony snorted and just stared stubbornly at a random dial on the wall. I'm going on a perimeter check. Jarvis can call me back if you need anything. Rody said. Tony just nodded. How's the girl? Rody asked then. Her name's B. Tony said right away. How's B? Rody asked in a softer tone. The same. Tony grunted and left. Rody let him walk away without a word. Jarvis, what's the extent of the damage? Tony asked when he returned to the kitchen. He drank a glass of juice again and made himself another piece of toast. Fortunately, sir, the majority of the damage did not affect the main structure of the building. The fundament and most of the barring walls are intact even after the Hulk's rampage. Your roof, on the other hand, is severely damaged. That requires the most immediate attention. Jarvis reported. Okay, how soon can we repair everything? Miss Potts. Has already approved of the schedule. I have prepared, Jarvis answered. You only need to set the starting date, sir. Right, I'll do that once we're all fine. Anything else? Dr. Algren called to let you know that he will return again this afternoon, Jarvis said. And Captain Rogers firmly instructed me to connect him through to you the second you have time. Tony sighed and rubbed at his face. Damn it all, but Rony was right. He couldn't avoid this forever. Fine, call him. Tony relented and moved over to the half-destroyed ground floor living room. Fortunately, it was empty. Rody was probably gone already while Pepper and Happy were on a Starks Industries-related errand since that morning. Tony didn't even ask her what it was about. Bruce was somewhere around. Jarvis already had a display up, but no live feed yet. It was lucky that most of Jarvis's systems were functional. A bunch of cameras, microphones, and holograph projectors were lost, but everything was working in the house. The system diagnosis still didn't find the error that made it possible for the strike team to get so close without Jarvis noticing, but Tony didn't have the time or the energy to do the checkup himself yet. It could wait. The Stark security had the house protected, not to mention the Iron Mage was still hovering above them. It was reassuring to have the ship so close. Steve finally appeared on the screen a moment later. He was all sweaty, so he was probably in the gym not that long ago. He was also wearing a deep frown that smoothed out a moment after he really looked at Tony. Hey, how is she? Steve asked right away. Not good, Tony said. Hatchets. Um, he's giving us time. Loki should be back tonight. He can probably heal her. That's good, Steve nodded. Listen, Tony... It goes without saying, I hope, that none of us knew anything about this, okay? Yeah, Cap, I know you that much. Don't worry. Tony said if Cap ever decided that they couldn't do this whole allies thing with Loki in the picture, he would say so. He would look Tony in the eye and tell him outright. Phil's been working on this from day one, Steve continued. Bucky has some contacts to him in other places, so we made a few calls. 
and Hank and Janet are back, so if you need help, we're here. Tony knew that he should probably ask who the heck Hank and Janet were, but at the moment, he couldn't care less. I've got everything under control now, Tony said. The whole security is here. Yeah, Luke and Danny know what to do. We've worked with them before. Steve nodded. Also, nearly every news channel is showing footages of your ship. Not sure if you're aware. I don't give a crap about that right now, to be honest, Tony said. Fair enough, Steve shrugged. Look, the reason why I wanted to call you is because Clint managed to get a hold of Natasha. Now that was finally interesting. When? Yesterday, I wanted to inform you as soon as possible, but yeah, I was busy. What did you say? She was very tight-lipped. Not that I'm surprised. Steve said. She only said that as far as she could tell, Fury was not the one to order the attack. We assumed that you were the target, but we can't be sure. As far as she could tell, Tony asked incredulously. That's not what I would expect from a master spy. Which is why I said that she was tight-lipped, Steve said. We also know that Fury's on the helicarrier, but nothing beyond that. Total radio silence from S.H.I.E.L.D. We're lucky Clint has other ways to contact Natasha. Why would she say it like that? Tony asked. Why make it so vague? Clint said she might be under watch. Steve said, this whole thing stinks. I will find who is responsible. Tony said, I don't care if it was Fury or someone else. I will find them and they will pay for this. You hear me, Cap? Steve looked at him for a moment, considering something. Understandable, but Tony, no, there is no but here. We were playing by the rules. We volunteered information. We did everything to keep this from happening. Fury or S.H.I.E.L.D., whoever it was, they were the ones who shit on all this. I did not make the first strike. His temper was rising rapidly, anger boiling in his gut. All the feelings of failure and uselessness were feeding his rage like coal and gasoline on a hungry flame. He wanted to strike back. He wanted to find whoever was responsible and show them who they were messing with. Tony, believe me, I get it. We will get to the bottom of this, but don't do anything reckless. Everything is suspicious about this. Don't do anything you will regret later. Why is it me who has to be responsible, huh? Tony yelled. Why do I have to be the patient, understanding one? Because you're a better man than whoever did this, Steve said firmly. I'm really not sure, Cap, Tony said, fighting down the urge to laugh hysterically. I really just want to find whoever did this and beat them until they stop moving. I'm not sure how better that makes me, and I don't care. Tony, I don't care, Tony yelled again. One of my girls is dying. She would already be dead if it wasn't for Hatchet. The mere thought turned Tony's stomach and just made him angrier. You know how many bullets the doc and Bruce got out of her? He asked. Seven. They shot her seven times. His throat was closing up, scratchy from tiredness and the sudden yelling. He was so angry and tired and he was tired of being angry. It was such a mess. Pray that she lives, Rogers. He said more quietly, but just as furious. Pray really hard, because if she doesn't make it, I would do a thing to stop Loki from taking revenge. I'll even help him. His chest hurt again, and his head was buzzing from all the blood rushing in his ears. Steve was silent for a long moment, just looking at Tony through the screen. I will, he said in the end. What? Tony asked. I will pray for her, Steve said. But not because I'm afraid of Loki. Or you. He said it so sincerely that Tony just couldn't look at his face anymore. He needed to be angry at someone, and Steve took the yelling without fighting back, but it didn't actually make him feel better. I... I gotta go. He said. I mean it, Tony. I want to help. Steve said. Call if you need anything. Yeah, fine. Tony nodded, finally getting his breath under control, his heart calming down. Steve nodded back, then Jarvis cut the feed. Tony took a deep breath and went back to be Juyu and Hatchet. What if Loki doesn't get back in time? Juyu asked. He will, Hatchet said quietly. His voice was weak and breathy, exhaustion too obvious to miss. The light shivers in his body didn't stop for a moment. His hands were shaking even worse. It won't be long now. He should be here already, 
do you said miserably tony deliberately didn't think of that it's not that loki was late because they never actually agreed on an exact time they just knew that he was supposed to arrive back sometime tonight he could get here any moment or in a few hours tony didn't think hatchet had another few hours in him Tony sat beside him, his back to the wall next to the bed, his outstretched legs resting next to Hatchet. Juyu was sitting up on the bed on the other side, her fingers gently running through Bee's hair. They were mostly quiet because Hatchet needed to concentrate a lot more than before. It was nerve-wracking. Bruce went to sleep after checking up on them a couple of hours ago. He was up all night the previous day, so he was obviously exhausted. Pepper and Happy got back an hour ago. As far as Tony knew, they were in the kitchen. Mike visited them in the afternoon again, but he could not say or do anything he hadn't said or done already. It was still a nice gesture that he came. It was not hard to remember why Tony started to like the guy in the first place. Now they were alone again, just the four of them. The silence was more oppressing than comfortable, like the air itself was heavy and weighed them all down. Hatchet tipped forward, resting his head on the bed, his shoulders rising and falling rapidly, shaking. The violet light surrounding his hand on B's shoulder wavered and dimmed a little. Hatchet? Tony called, moving closer. I'm fine, the elf mumbled. The heck you are, Tony said. He put a hand on Hatchet's shoulder, wanting to pull him up to look at his face. It became much more obvious how badly he was shaking. You gotta stop. No! Hatchet said, he'll be back soon. And what is he going to do if he finds you dead? Tony asked, you did a lot for her. She can pull through until Loki gets back. We can get Bruce and Mike back. They can make sure she's fine. No, Hatchet said again. You're such a stubborn bastard. Tony said, squeezing his shoulder more firmly. What was Tony supposed to do? Hatchet was weak enough that Tony probably could have dragged him away, but B... That meant risking B. Tony hated all this, hated it so much. He glanced up at Yu Yu, who was staring at them both with bright and swollen eyes, worried and scared. Tony felt useless again, useless and indecisive. The rational part of him said that pulling Hatchet away would be like turning off life support, but damn it, B was still there. She could still be fine. It wasn't like she was some brain dead body with no chance of recovery. Don't you dare die on me, Tony said to Hatchet instead, sitting down next to the elf this time, an arm still around his shaking shoulders. He never seemed thin, not even with a slender frame, because he was tall and loud and bright. Now he felt small and fragile. You hear me? Loki would be so pissed, you have no idea. Hatchet was heaving, his breath deep and quick, like he had to gulp down the air. Tony kept looking at him, waiting for a sign that said that it was too much, that Hatchet had to be pulled away. That's when he noticed the few strands of golden hair on his head, almost completely hidden between the white locks. Hatchet, look at me, Tony said. He tried to pull Hatchet's head up without moving his hand away from B. In the end, he had to put a hand under his chin to turn his face towards Tony. There were more golden strands on the other side of his face, and also a few stray blonde hairs in his eyebrows. His eyes looked darker, no longer bright violet, but indigo. Turning blue, Tony realized with a start. Elves had blonde hair and blue eyes. Hatchet, your hair and eyes. Hatchet was still breathing unevenly, and his skin was clammy and cool from sweat. Expected as much, Hatchet said. It's fine. It will be fine. I don't... He cut himself off before he could finish. He didn't believe Hatchet, but he couldn't say that out loud. That would be like accepting it as a fact. Accepting that this was going to end horribly wrong. He didn't know what to do, but those words got stuck in his throat as well. Damn it, Hatchet. He cursed. I'm thirsty. Was what Hatchet said with a dim smile. The stupid, stubborn bastard. I'll get you one of Pepper's smoothies, all right? Tony said as he stood up. Hate strawberries, Hatchet mumbled as he laid his head down on the bed again. I told Pepper, said she could be my friend now. Yeah, she hates them too, Tony said, huffing, but it was nowhere near a laugh. Julia reached across B to rest a hand on Hatchet's head, and she looked up at Tony questioningly.
There was no reassurance he could give her. He should have. He should have told her that it was going to be fine, not to worry. But he didn't know that. He wasn't going to lie. He barely stepped out of the room when Jarvis spoke. Sir, I detect a distinct energy spike in the main room. I have turned the remaining windows reflective. Tony's heart almost stopped for a moment, then it started to beat fervently. He was running across the house as quickly as he could. His mind was stuck on a repeat of Loki, Loki, Loki. It had to be. It just had to be. He nearly ran into a couch and fell when he ran inside the room because he wasn't watching where he was going, but he managed to evade it in the last second. Stark! The voice was both frantic and relieved, but it was nothing compared to the relief Tony felt when he looked up at the two of them. Oh, thank God. He breathed. He wasn't ashamed that he was pretty damn close to shed a tear or two because fucking hell, finally! He dashed across the room where Loki and Rongo stood and wrapped the god up in his arms before the other could ask anything, squeezing him as tightly as he could. Loki returned the embrace right away, holding him. What happened? What is this? Loki asked. You're injured. That snapped Tony out of his daze. He pulled back immediately. No, I'm fine. Come on, hurry. He said and grabbed hold of Loki's hand, dragging him across the room, running. B and Hatchet. Come on! He couldn't form words coherently at the moment. All the stress and sleepless nights were finally catching up with him a little, but it didn't matter. Loki was back. Loki stood frozen in the doorway for one moment, eyes widening in shock. Then he was across the room in a blink and down on the floor next to Hatchet by the bed. Ah, you made it. Great, Hatchet said faintly. I got her. Let go. Come on, you did enough, Loki said firmly. He reached out to lay a hand on Bee's chest and pried Hatchet's hand away from her shoulder. When the violet light of magic finally vanished, Hatchet just sort of crumbled by the foot of the bed, his head resting on the covers. Take him out. He needs rest, Loki said, not looking at either of them. His whole focus was on Bee. Tony took it on himself to walk over to the elf and help him up from the floor because Drongo just stood there like a statue, his face grim and his fists clenched impossibly tight. Can you heal her? Do you asked. There was so much hope and tentative relief in her voice that Tony wanted to wrap her up in his arms again, but he had Hatchet to take care of first. I can help her heal faster. Loki said his hands already covered in the bright green and golden glow of his magic. It should be enough. Tony felt a stab of pain when he lifted Hatchet's arm over his shoulder and pulled him up to his feet, but he just clenched his jaw and sucked it up. Hatchet was heavy, but he only needed to rest some of his weight on Tony. Come on, buddy. Time to sleep, Tony told him. Good idea, Hatchet said. Tony was astonished that he was still conscious and that he could walk with some help. That lifted another heavy weight from his heart because it was a good sign. They walked out of the room slowly. Tony didn't want to take him as far as the next undamaged bedroom. He figured a sofa would suffice for now. Hatchet could go to his own room once he slept first. Told you I could do it, Hatchet said after a moment. Tony laughed a little, the relief making his heart light. Yeah, you did, Tony said, grinning. You just scared the crap out of me in the meantime. He didn't feel even a little bad about admitting it. They had this game of banter and insults going on for them, something that stayed behind from the days when they truly did not stand each other. But those days were long gone. They both knew it. I'm a little scared, too, Hatchet slurred. That was... present tense? Hatchet! Tony stopped at Juyu's voice, and a moment later the girl was running up to them. He's gotta go rest, Ju, Tony told her. I know, I just... Thank you. She said to Hatchet, fidgeting with her hands. It was fine, Hatchet said. It was something Tony really hated to hear at this point. He was going to ban the word. Hatchet was not allowed to use it anymore. I know, but... She walked a little closer. I still wanted to thank you for helping her so much. Even if you only did it for Loki. Don't be stupid, girl. Hatchet told her with a wan smile. Yu Yu looked up at him, her eyes too bright with tears. Then she moved forward to hug the elf tightly. Tony let go of him before Yu Yu got there. She could take Hatchet's weight easily. It's okay, Hatchet said, leaning on her and stroking her hair a little. 
Chiu Yu nodded but didn't let go of him, just hugged him for a few long moments. Hatchet's hand fell off from her head, and Ju Yu had to take a step back to hold him up when he suddenly went limp in her arms. Whoa! Ju Yu exclaimed and grabbed him tighter to slowly lower him to the floor. Okay, he passed out. Tony said, let's get him on the sofa. Ju Yu turned to look at him, and her eyes were wide and alarmed again. He's cold, she said faintly. Hatchet was half on the floor now, only his upper body resting on Ju Yu. Is he supposed to be cold? Tony got down next to them immediately and put a hand on the elf's slack and pale face. The skin was still damp, but Juyu was right. He was cold to the touch. He was still warm when Tony was holding him a few moments ago. Now his skin wasn't just cold from sweat. There was no trace of warmth. It was not as cold as ice, but like... Tony felt the blood drain from his face. Oh, no.